Hi everyone, Doug and Julie here with our 2021 Ford Mustang Mach-E electric vehicle. And in this video, I'd like to give a long overdue follow-up to our part one video on charging. In that video, we covered the basics, so if you're new to EVs, I'd recommend checking out episode seven of the Mach-E files to catch you up. This part two video has been challenging to write because EVs, and especially public charging for EVs, is in a period of tremendous growth and change, and some of the information I share here may be out of date by the time you watch this. Still, we're going to discuss things like charging mentality, address public charging etiquette, and share some charging tips, so I think this can still be a helpful video. But first, I wanted to give a little bit of an update on a few things we noted in part one. For starters, our home charging method hasn't fundamentally changed. We still charge on this Grizzle E Level 2 Home EVSE, which works great. With our car's good range, we can easily make a week's worth of office visits and run our weekend errands without needing to charge, often needing less than 50% of the battery. But we still like to have a full battery when we start each week, especially during winter or if it looks like we're going to have stormy weather. So we'll plug in every Sunday after our last errand and charge it up. Sadly, our electricity rates have gone up, almost 20%. Of course, we still have our solar panels that mostly cover our usage throughout the year. But if we didn't, to charge our Mach-E, zero to full, would now cost us about $15. Still much cheaper per mile than any of our past gas cars. Probably a bigger deal is the fast charging rates have gone up as well. When we first bought our Mach-E, charging at an Electrify America cost about 43 to 46 cents per kilowatt hour, but now that's closer to 60 cents per kilowatt hour. But even that is still cheaper than anything but the most efficient gas cars, especially with West Coast gas prices. In episode 7, I noted the Mach-E's battery was a 98 kilowatt hour pack with 88 kilowatt hour usable. But Ford has updated that and our battery now has 91 kilowatt hour usable. It's not a lot, but we appreciate the bump. We can look at this as either increasing our range overall or as not needing to be as efficient to meet the EPA range rating of 300 miles. Before, we needed to average 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour where now we only need to get 3.3 miles per kilowatt hour. However you look at it, it's better. The Mach-E's charging curve has also been updated. And once again, it's not a huge difference, but the most obvious improvement is there is less drop off when the battery hits 80%. On our most recent road trip, we charged past 80% a few times and still saw speeds comfortably in the high 30 kilowatt range. Not super fast, but far better than the 11 or 12 kilowatt from before. Our Ford-supplied portable EVSE has occasionally been overheating, so we decided to invest in a new one from Grizzle E. Check out episode 14 for more details on that. It could actually serve as our one and only charge cord, but since we have the Grizzle E Classic already, we just keep this one in the front. We do still have the Ford unit, but it stays in the trunk. Frankly, we'll probably never use that one again. Since we now have access to the Tesla supercharging network, we have three adapters to make that process easy. Why do we have three? It's a bit of a long story. Check out episode 15 of the Maki Files if you're interested in more on that. The good news is they all work well and make a tremendous difference on road trips. Although if I had to pick a favorite, I think it would be the Electron Vortex. Ford has actually partnered with Electron to add a second official adapter to go along with the Tesla made adapter. In addition to having access to Tesla superchargers, the rest of the charging infrastructure is continuing to grow. At the end of 2024, the US passed the 200,000 public charger mark with more than 50,000 fast chargers. We've noticed a few of these new locations around us, but a quick search will find any number of big new stations popping up around the country, many a result of the NEVI program. Even if the new administration succeeds in pulling the plug on the whole program, other companies are stepping up to build more and more charging locations across the country. While driving an EV is really not that different than driving a gas car, charging one takes a bit of a different mindset. In some ways, it seems like charging an EV is much harder, but in other ways, it seems much, much easier. For example, there are far more gas stations than public charging locations, so arguably it's more convenient to refuel a gas car than charge an EV. And even with the fastest charging EVs, stopping to fill a gas car is going to be faster, likely much faster. But the advantage really shifts to EVs when you're able to charge at home. With a level two charger, any EV can be fully charged overnight while you sleep. I've used a gas pump maybe three or four times in the past three years, and that was only because I was driving a family member's car or a rental. We don't miss it one bit, and we love the ease and convenience of charging at home. The other big difference is, when fueling a gas car, most people will fill it up completely. Unless you only have funds for a few gallons, there's really no reason not to. But with an EV, you actually rarely charge to 100% full. 
You can, of course, and if you have a regular need for a full battery, you should absolutely do so. More and more studies are finding that EV batteries are lasting a lot longer than expected, and certainly longer than all of the naysayers are suggesting. But to be on the safe side, the general expert opinion still suggests charging only to 80 or 90 percent to extend your battery life. Our Mach-E is set to charge to 90 percent at home unless we're about to travel, when we'll take it to 100 percent. Aside from protecting the battery life, if you're road tripping, you likely won't fully charge at every stop because of the time it takes to do so. Unless you have a super fast charging vehicle, your charging speed will slow down so much above 80%, it makes more sense to unplug a little early and just move on to the next charge station. Our Mach-E, for example, takes about 40 minutes to charge from 10% to 80%, but that last 20%? That may take an additional 40 minutes, or more. In that amount of time, it would be faster to make a couple of extra short stops rather than sit there for that last 20%. This is also good etiquette if the charge location is busy and there are people waiting. And speaking of etiquette, when talking about etiquette, we're mostly talking about level three or public fast charging, although some of these tips apply to level two public charging as well. It's important to understand these are not hard and fast rules, but suggestions to make public charging more fair and equitable with your fellow EV owners. If there's an overall theme to charging etiquette, it's that you are not alone in whatever charging situation you find yourself, even if it feels that way. We're all in this together. Courtesy and patience are the name of the game here. So with that in mind, the first etiquette tip is don't hog charging spots, and don't take up more than one if you can help it. Not all charging locations are the same, especially for CCS chargers. So when pulling in, take note of where your charge port is and how it relates to the charger location, and always pull in square to the spot. The one big caveat to this is for non-Teslas charging at Tesla supercharger stations. Because these stations were originally designed only for Teslas, most of them have cords that are too short to reach the charge ports on the growing number of other manufacturers' vehicles, our Mach-E included. With the exception of what are referred to as V4 stations, you may have to take up two spots to charge at the Tesla superchargers. Tesla is aware of this and actually recommends doing so. Although it must be said, this is not an excuse to park like an idiot, even if you think you're the only one charging. If at all possible, it's strongly recommended to park parallel with other spots, not angled or even perpendicular as that may end up blocking other vehicles, or even block yourself in. The bottom line is, again, be considerate of your fellow EV travelers. The good news is most Tesla supercharger locations have plenty of stations to support many different vehicles. And as noted earlier, newer locations with the V4 chargers have longer cords, so it's not necessary to take up two spots when charging at these. So don't. More etiquette tips related to this one. Only park at a charger if you're charging. Just because these spots are dedicated to EVs only doesn't mean you're free to just park there whenever. And when you're done charging, as soon as you're done charging, move. Here again, there have been a number of times when Julie and I have plugged into charge with no one else around, gone into a store or a restaurant, only to come out to the rest of the chargers occupied. Even with all the growth and the number of new chargers, EV adoption is still outpacing the infrastructure. Locations can get busy fast, and charging an EV takes long enough without having to wait for another EV to unplug and move on. And speaking of busy stations, unless you absolutely have to, consider only charging to 80%. As noted earlier, that last 20% can take an inordinately long time, and any queue at a busy station is just going to get longer if everybody is dead set on charging to 100%. Frankly, it's faster for you and for those waiting if you unplug at or around 80% and move on. Of course, if you're not on a road trip, if you're a local and public fast charging is your only option, just be conscious of the situation around you and use your best judgment. If you arrive at a busy or full station, take note of any other EVs around you, in some locations, an actual line will form, but in others, cars will park nearby and wait. If you're at all unsure, remember Communication 101. Just get out and ask around. Check your tone. No matter how tired or frustrated you might be, keep it light and friendly. But most people are understanding of the situation, and there's nothing wrong with just wanting to clarify who's waiting and who is next in line. We have found other EV drivers actually appreciate the initiative. At the same time, be considerate of people who may not be as open to chatting as you are. We've found a lot of people like to talk EVs, but for sure there are others who just want to be left alone. If you arrive at a full location and want to know when others are going to be finished, try checking a charging screen first. If that's not possible, just be conscious of how you approach a person in a vehicle. Don't be aggressive and try not to be creepy. Keep a good distance unless they indicate it's okay to approach. Never unplug another person's vehicle, even if they're fully charged and nowhere to be found. 
This is more likely to be a situation at a level 2 station, but certainly can happen at a fast charger. On rare occasions, an owner will hang a sign on their car giving the OK to unplug if they're at 100%, but unless there is clear indication from the owner, leave it alone. Every vehicle charges at a different speed, and many chargers output energy at different speeds. You should know yours and, whenever possible, use the appropriate charger for your vehicle. For example, our Mach-E has a max charging speed of 150 kilowatts, so using a 350 kilowatt charger when a 150 kilowatt charger is available is pretty pointless, and maybe taking that faster charger away from an owner who can really use it. This is becoming less and less of an issue as more and more higher kilowatt chargers are being installed, but it's still worth keeping an eye out for. Speaking of new chargers, there are a number of new locations opening up with shared chargers, where one station has two functioning plugs. But a lot of these also have shared power. So for example, a 200 kilowatt charger only puts out 200 kilowatts to one plug. If two cars are charging, the power is split and likely only getting 100 kilowatts each. If you come across one of these locations, try not to plug into a unit being used by another EV. Oh, and don't be confused, not every station with two plugs is shared. Electrify America units often have two plugs but can only charge one vehicle at a time. If you are an adventurous soul and actually tow long distance with your EV, you're going to hate me for saying this, but unhitch your trailer before you charge. I know, it's a pain. But as noted earlier, even if you show up at a location where no one else is there charging, odds are someone will be coming along soon, and you and or your trailer could be in the way. The obvious exception would be a charging location with dedicated spots for towing vehicles and there are more and more of these around. But at more basic locations, unhitch your rig, please. And finally, leave every station in good order. Don't leave any trash, clean up after your pets, and put the charging plugs back where they belong. So to finish this video, I thought I'd share a few random tips. If you have any more tips, please add them in the comments below. When traveling, remember to ABC, always be charging. Of course, you'll likely have your charging stops planned, but whenever possible, say if you have to stop for an emergency restroom break, consider plugging in while doing so. Five or 10 minutes on a fast charger might give you just enough juice to move that next charging stop even further down the road. When we travel, we tend to set a conservative route plan. And by that, I mean our Mach-E has a 260 to 300 mile highway range, but we rarely go more than 200 miles before stopping to charge. This leaves us plenty of range if we run into broken chargers or locations that are super busy. We try not to drop below 20% in case we have to go another stop further. Quite frankly, 200 miles is a good 3 hours of driving, and by then we want to get out of the car for a stretch anyway. Not all charging spots are located near food, so if you're planning to eat during a charging stop, plan ahead and make sure you have options to do so. You may have to grab your food on the way to the charger locations. Same for restrooms. In fact, many charging stations have a bare minimum of amenities. We carry a spray bottle of glass cleaner and a roll of paper towels in our frunk so we can clean our windshield while charging. Some don't even have trash receptacles, so a small bag or can in your vehicle is a good idea. Our experience is hotel charging is notoriously unreliable. We've heard many stories of hotels with broken chargers or that just have one and it's already taken. Consider hotel charging a bonus, not a definitive plan. If you can charge at a hotel and you're feeling courteous, check in with the front desk when you're charging and when you're done, in case anyone else is waiting. If someone else is charging, let the front desk know you're waiting and how to contact you as they might be able to let you know when it's free. It's a little bit EV 101, but cold temperatures can make road tripping significantly longer. It not only reduces range, but also charging time. Some vehicles have battery preconditioning to help, but if you have to road trip in cold weather, be sure to plan for extra time. A few charging companies have memberships that can help reduce prices. For example, Electrify America and Tesla offer a program that has a monthly subscription fee, but then the at the pump price is significantly lower. You'll have to do the math to see if it's worthwhile to you. Also note it may interfere with plug and charge, meaning you'll have to start the charge through an app on your phone. When road tripping, take advantage of the time it takes to charge. Get out of the car for a good stretch or even a little walk. It helps pass the time and it helps make any extended seat time more comfortable. It's actually much healthier too. So there you have it, our part two video on charging. Will there be a part three? Quite likely. As I stated at the beginning of this video, the world of EV ownership and especially EV charging is growing and evolving so quickly it's hard to keep up. But we're in it for the long haul. 
So whether it's with the Mach-E or with a second EV or something entirely different, we'll check back in after a few years and see how it's going. In the meantime, happy motoring!